Prayer is a communication. The reason I opened today and said I wasted so many hours of my life praying when I should have just been talking to the Father is because I wasted so many of my hours knocking when I should have just leaned over to the Father and said, here's my heart, and I'm going to leave it alone. Because how many of you found under this new covenant under understanding who you are, when you finally understand you, that you are one of his children, you found that when you just lay it in front of Daddy and leave it alone, great things happen. When you lay it in front of dad and then lay it in front of dad and lay it in front of dad and lay it in front of dad, it starts to take on a form where you are having to work. Asking God, asking God, asking God, asking God, asking God over, 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 over. Instead of at, petition the Father, lay it down. That's why I said I think so much of our prayer should be meditation. We should be listening twice as much as we talk. Most of us talk, 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 talk. We'll get done and go, why doesn't God ever talk to me? And I've started telling people it's because you don't shut up long enough. <laughs> to ever really listen to God talk to you. Because, I mean, your prayer life is just you telling God over and over and over and over and over and over and over again who's sick, who's dying, who's needy, who help, needs help, what you need to do, what, how you need purged, how you need forgiven, how you need changed, how you're confessing, this, 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 this. And then when we stop, we give God like five seconds. He doesn't move us. We don't get an emotional tickle. No goosebumps stand up in the back of our neck. We say amen, get done, and go, well, I'll try it again later. Or the father wants constant communication because that's what I love with my kids. However, I don't have to have my kids jabber jaw on the whole time we're in the car together. Just being in the car with them is pretty nice. Just going home. I get on a plane tonight, fly home, get home. We don't have to talk, talk, talk. We'll, we'll talk a little bit. We'll, we'll talk. We'll converse. But how many of you know, if you haven't seen them, you just want to be in the same room? With people you love, you don't have to. My wife and I have been married 22 years. Beautiful thing is if we go away by ourselves, just to have a weekend or whatever, there'll be, whole, there'll be hours and hours and hours we sit in the same room and don't talk. And it's not because we don't like the sound of one another's voice. It's because we've become so comfortable in one another's presence. We don't have to talk. It's just being around one another that's great. In fact, that's one of the most comfortable moments in my life because I'm around somebody who might be completely open and honest and real and comfortable around. I don't have to worry about anything. Anybody notice this? We've got a lot of marriages here. Probably a whole lot of people could say the same thing. Why is that? Because you've grown to a level of comfort that you don't even really have to communicate anymore over some things. You just know by the way their face moves. You know by the way the body language is. You know exactly what is up. Right? Now, why do we feel that way with our spouse, but we don't feel that way with our father? It's because we don't treat our father in the same way. It's because we have a knock mentality. It's because there's still a bit of our self that thinks there's something we can do to move the heart of God. My children never need to come to me and say, Dad, 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 Dad. See how old that's getting? And, I'm, and you're not even my dad. And that's getting old. What I do like six times, you were already going, just move on, preacher. Okay, well, that's how I feel. And that's how you feel. So you go to, <laughs> I don't need that. And I don't want that. And I also, it bothers me when I see my children consistently having a bad opinion of me, persistently thinking, Dad's going to think this about me. You know, if one of my children do something and fail, and they think, well, Dad's, gonna, Dad, Dad's response is going to be this, and then Dad's response is not that, that's a beautiful moment. It's a beautiful teaching moment. If they fail again and they think Dad's response is going to be this, that, that starts to bother me. They go, why, why do they still think that I'm, my response is going to be negative? As much love and as much grace as I pour out on them. And yet we still treat our Father this way. Still repetitious petition in front of our Father as if He's some distant overlord. Just rest and relax when you talk to Dad. Ask the Father. Petition the Father. Leave it at His feet. Let Him do the work. If he asked for bread, you wouldn't give him a stone. If he asked for a fish, you wouldn't give him a serpent. If he asked for an egg, you wouldn't give him a scorpion. If you then being evil, and this is an indictment, it's one of the rare moments where Jesus calls his crowd evil, and he's talking to his disciples, right? Which in a, in a new covenant church, we would go, no, you don't, don't ever call people evil because they're all the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus, but Jesus is using it in a social setting, going, you don't even know what they need, and yet you don't hesitate to give them what it is that they're looking for. In Mark and Luke, it says, 
The Father will give the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 7, 11, same story. Jesus says, how much more would the Father give you good things to those that ask him? So if we being evil, we're not even very good at this, and yet we try to give good things to our children, how much more will our Father, who is very good at this and is the very opposite of evil, not give us good things? 